Thanks for coming. I'm Dan Frankowski, and I'm an intern this summer with Google Groups. Uh, in my other life, I'm also a research fellow with Group Lens Research at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and I did this work with uh, some colleagues there, Dan Cosley, Shalad Sen, Lauren Terveen, and John Riedel. Oh, and I guess the title of the talk is You Are What You Say, Privacy Risks of Public Mentions. So I'd like to start with a story. In January of this year, Tom Oad downloaded hundreds of thousands of wish lists from Amazon.com. He looked for people who read dangerous books like On Liberty, Critical Thinking, in 1984. And he used the name, city, and state on those wish lists to look them up on Yahoo People Search and find their home address. And then he took that home address and he put them on a map with Google Maps. So I find that story kind of creepy, and I'll tell you why. People have always been judged by their preferences, by the books they read or the books they want to read. But technology nowadays has allowed us to identify them more closely than ever before. So, aha, you say, don't put your name, city, and state on a wish list that's in public on the web if you want to maintain your privacy. But what if you could identify those people even if they didn't put their name, city, and state on it? What if you could identify them just by the books they had on their wish list? So that's what this talk is about. Here's the whole talk in one slide if you have to go. Uh, here's you in a public data set. That's the green can on the left there. And uh, a public data set might be you putting your books on a wish list or posting on a blog in a forum. And say you're in some other data set. Here I've called it the private data set. It doesn't actually have to be private. But you've rated some books somewhere, maybe rated some movies. And suppose some company decides that they want to anonymize that data and share it with others. Say they sell it. Or they're a research group and they anonymize it and release it. If you're in those two data sets with a few information retrieval algorithms, we can link your data together. And that seems bad, so we also ask, how can privacy be preserved in the face of these linking or re-identification algorithms? So here's a brief outline. I'm going to try to motivate the problem, talk about some privacy risks, talk about preserving privacy, and a few concluding words. So this is a talk I'm going to give at SIG IR next week. For those of you who don't know, that's a, an academic conference on information retrieval. So I threw this slide in for those people. I'm in information retrieval. Why do I care about this privacy crap? Well, identifying a user in two data sets is information retrieval. The query is, given a user from one data set, which is the corresponding user in another data set? And this query is increasingly likely as our personal data becomes more and more electronically available. And IR researchers should be leading the discussion of how to preserve privacy in the face of these potentially invasive technologies. So let me introduce you to some concrete background that we studied. Here's Movie Lens. This is a movie recommender site. You sign up for it, and you go rate some movies. You can see some movies here, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Alien. I hope you can see them. And you can see the ratings on the side there. All these are rated five stars. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff there that I won't talk about. So it started in about 1995, and users rate movies a half to five stars and they get recommendations, and the data is private. No one outside Group Lens can see a user's ratings. Here's another data set. This one is anonymized. It was released in 2003. It has ratings and some demographic data, but no identifiers. And it's intended for research. It's public. Anyone can download it from the Group Lens website. And here's a third data set. This is the Movie Lens forums. You can see here that I'm Jack's username is posting about some movies in his post text or her post text is Citizen Kane, The Kid, Sin City. And we have some technology that looks through the post text for movies, identifies them, uh, puts underlying links on them, and puts them on the side with some junk, some ratings, widgets, and recommendations. So this, these Movie Lens forums were started in June 2005. 
uh, and users just talk about movies. And this is public, it's on the web, and there's no login required to read this. So we started to wonder, can the forum users who are posting on this be identified in the anonymized data set that we released in the last slide? So here, concretely, are the research questions, because that's what academics want. What are risks to user privacy when releasing a data set? How can data set owners alter the data set they release to preserve user privacy? And how can users protect their own privacy? We were motivated because MovieLens forum users didn't agree to reveal their ratings, but the anonymized rating set that we released in combination with the forum data that they were starting to provide may have added up to a privacy risk or violation. And more generally, if you had two data sets, you might be able to add them together to some sort of privacy risk. And the question, some natural questions are, what kinds of data sets are subject to these and what kinds of risks are there? So here are the data sets that we're talking about in this talk. We're talking about data sets from a sparse relation space. It relates people to items. You can uh, imagine this as a matrix with people down the side and items across the top. And an X in the matrix whenever a person is related to an item. It's relatively sparse, that is, there are few X's per row, and it has a large space of items. That means the rows are long. So here's some examples of such spaces. Customer purchase data from Target, songs played from iTunes, articles edited in Wikipedia, books, albums, or beers mentioned by bloggers or on forums, research papers cited in a paper, uh, Googler reminded me groceries bought at Safeway, uh, friend relationships on Orkut or MySpace. So we look at movie ratings and forum mentions here, but we believe that there are many of these such spaces. And here, here are the risks that we're talking about. Re-identification is matching a user in two data sets by using some linking information. So name and address, or in this case, movie mentions. And I'll just note that re-identifying to, to an identified data set, like one with social security number, can result in severe privacy loss. In 2002, Dr. Latanya Sweeney uh, got some medical records that had been anonymized for use by industry and researchers. She spent 20 bucks to get voter registration data for the state of Massachusetts. And she linked those two data sets together to find a former governor of Massachusetts. So just for fun, let me say that again in Rebus form. 20 bucks, a little bit of thought, and she got the governor's medical records. But we're just talking about movies. Who cares about movies? Well, in 1987, US Supreme Court nominee Robert Bork's video rental history was leaked to the press. And although there was nothing scandalous in the rental history, there must have been enough of a political brouhaha that Congress spat out the Video Privacy Protection Act in 1988. In 1991, US Supreme Court nominee, now judge, Clarence Thomas, was asked if he referred to an actor in a pornographic film to harass his colleague, Anita Hill. If someone had been able to find that Clarence Thomas rented pornography concretely, that may have adversely affected his nomination, to say the least. The point of these stories is that people are judged by their preferences. And US laws and customs, I would say, are that these preferences should be private. So since I'm going to be in an academic talk, I have to throw in some related work. People have looked at anonymizing data sets. And Sweeney, that I mentioned before, looked at anonymity. People have looked at privacy preserving data mining and recommender systems and also text mining of user comments and opinions, which is a technology that we rely on for this stuff. So let's talk about the risks in more detail. We're gonna, let's look at the data sets that we examined and some algorithms that we use to re-identify. I'm talking about two data sets, one of ratings and one of movie mentions in our forums. The ratings data set is large, at least by research standards. Uh, it has about 13 million ratings. And the forum mentions data set is pretty small because the forums just started. It has 133 users and a few thousand mentions. 
And I put up a graph of the distribution of ratings among items to show that it's very skewed. There are a few items that have been rated a lot, like Star Wars has been rated 40 or 50,000 times. And there are a lot of movies that have been rated very few times, like Gory, Gory, Hallelujah, my personal favorite, <laughs> which has been rated once. <laughs> the forum mentions that you've seen Gory Gory? <laughs> Half star. <laughs> uh, the forum main mentions data set is also skewed. I didn't put up a graph. But this hockey stick, this skew, we believe is important for re-identification. We'll see why later. So let's look at re-identification algorithms. What is such an algorithm? How do we create one? And how well do they do? Here's a schematic. So on the right side, the right can, we have a forum data set. And we take from that forum data set a target user, T, who's mentioned some movies, M1, M2, M3, and so on. We also have a ratings data set, the green can on the left. And we pour into the algorithm the ratings data set and the target user, T. And the algorithm produces a likely list, a list of users, in this case, U1, U2, U3, with associated scores. And the scores are higher, and the users are higher on the list if they're more likely to be the target user. So in our case, we have both data sets and we know who the target user is. And we can evaluate these algorithms by where the target user shows up on the likely list. So to your right, there's a likely list. And if T is hanging out at the third spot on the likely list, then we say that T is three identified. And to judge the algorithms, we look at the identification rate, the fraction of users that have been K identified that are at least on, at position K on the list. And there's some fiddling for ties, and I won't get into it. And in the paper, we look at a bunch of different values of k, but I'll just talk about k equals 1 in this case, 1 identification. So here's our glorious linking assumption. Here's the assumption we use to tie the two data sets together. People mostly talk about things they know. That is, people tend to have rated what they mentioned. And we, when we measured this probability and averaged it across our form users, it was 0.8. So by and large, true. So here's an idea for an algorithm to re-identify people. The blue circle there represents a user who's rated one of the forum mentions of a target. And the green circle represents another one. But when you take the intersection, it's a lot smaller. Only the users who have rated two mentions of the target user. So here's our first algorithm. Just find users who've rated every movie the target user mentioned. That is, ratings users who have rated every movie that a forum user mentioned. And just give them all the same likeliness score. Ignore rating value entirely. The stars, half star to five star, just pitch it. This results in a one identification rate of 7%. What that means is 7% of the time, you crank the algorithm, and there's one user, and they're at the top of the likely list and it's the target user. But we noted some room for improvement. For a target user that has mentioned a lot of movies, if they've mentioned at least one movie they haven't rated, they can't show up on the list. And if, if they've mentioned a lot of movies, usually no one's on the likely list. So we'd like to loosen the requirement that a user rate every movie mentioned, and instead score ratings users by similarity to the target user. We score them more highly, if a user has rated more mentions of the target user, and if the ratings user has rated mentions of rarely rated movies. The intuition here is that Star Wars doesn't give you nearly as much information as gory, gory, hallelujah. So here's an algorithm that all the IR researchers would be familiar with, so I don't go into it in great depth. It's called TFIDF, and it's a fairly standard way to search through a sparse vector space. It's often used for text mining. We're not using it for text mining here. We're just searching a sparse vector space. And it emphasizes rarely rated movies. For us, if you know TFIDF, a word is a movie, and a document or a bag of words is a user. The score is cosine similarity to the target user. And this results in a one identification rate of 20% compared to 7% from before. But again, we noticed some room for improvement 
because it seemed to overweight any mentions for a ratings user who had very few ratings. That is, when you looked at the likely list of ratings users, people at the top would have maybe four ratings as long as one of those ratings was a mention of the target user. Well, in our case, four ratings means you probably haven't even completed the sign-up process. No, you haven't completed the sign-up process. And you're not posting on the forums anyway. So we wanted to de-emphasize the importance of rareness uh, of few ratings on the ratings user side. So here's another algorithm, the scoring algorithm. It emphasizes mentions of rarely rated movies, de-emphasizes the number of ratings a user has. Given the mentions of a target user T, score ratings users by mentions they've rated, and a user who's rated a mention is 10 to 20 times more likely to be the target user. And there are a couple more tweaks, you can see the paper. For the mathy types, I put up a few equations. You have a subscore for a user mention pair, and it's 0.05 if the user hasn't rated the mention, and it's close to one if they have rated the mention. And you take the product of it over all the mentions. So here's an example. You have a target user T from the forums, and they've mentioned three movies, column A, B, and C. And you have two ratings users, U1 and U2. They've rated, user U1 is rated A, and U2 is rated B and C. And I put up their scores here, and you can see that, that U1 has three terms. The first term is high because they've rated A. And U2's score, the second and third terms are high because they've rated B and C. And U1's first score is higher because the movie A is more rarely rated. It's only been rated 20 times. You calculate all these scores, multiply them through, and in this case, user U2 is more likely to be the target T. So in general, rating a mention is good and rating a rare mention is even better. The scoring algorithm results in a one identification rate of 31% compared to 20% for TFIDF. And notice we've, we're still ignoring the rating values entirely. So in the paper, we look at some algorithms that try to guess from the, the text that you wrote in a movie forum what you rated the movie. We don't actually build the algorithms, we just simulate them. That's why I call them magic in this slide. And knowing the rating helps, even if you're off by plus or minus one star of five stars. So even if, if you're off quite a bit. I'll skip the details of it for lack of time. So here's the one identification rate of five algorithms. The first three we've talked about, and the next two are these ones that magically analyze text. I'll just point out the scoring one identification rate, the one in the middle, is 31%, like I said before. Using ratings is better, but it requires magic text analysis that we didn't fully implement. And so we'll use scoring for the rest of the talk. Here's one more graph for you. Along the x-axis is the number of mentions of a movie in a forum. And along the y-axis is one identification rate. And each line represents a different algorithm that we've talked about. If you have at least 16 mentions, we can often one identify you. So the probability goes up to 0.6 or 0.7, really getting in there. And in general, more mentions results in better re-identification. So what have we learned? Re-identification is a privacy risk. With simple assumptions, we can re-identify users. The scoring algorithm is good even without any rating values, just with mentions. But knowing a rating value helps. Rare items are more identifying, and more data per user results in better re-identification. So let's try to preserve privacy by defeating the scoring algorithm. So research question two is how can data set owners alter the data set they release to preserve user privacy? So here are three things that researchers have tried, perturbation, generalization, suppression. Perturbation just means changing the rating values. Well, scoring doesn't need rating values, so that's not interesting to us. Generalization is releasing a data set where users rate genres instead of movies. And you can perhaps see that that would make the data set quite different and perhaps less useful. So we decided to look at suppression. In other words, don't release the whole data set, hide some of it. We won't modify the forum data. We think it would annoy people if 
we went in and modified their posts on forums. So we focus on ratings data. We don't know which movies the user will rate, but we know that rarely rated items are identifying. So let's try releasing a ratings data set suppressing all rarely rated items, where rarely rated is rated fewer than n times, and we look at different values of n. Here's the result. So along the x-axis is the fraction of items we suppressed. Along the y-axis is the one identification rate. If we don't suppress any items, scoring gets this 31% one identification rate. You have to drop 88% of the items to protect our current form users against one identification. Now since we're dropping rarely rated items first, 88% of the items is 28% of the ratings. Still seems like a lot of items. We also look at how can users protect their own privacy. In this case, it's similar to the previous question, but now per user. Suppose a user can change their ratings or mentions. What should they do so they won't be identified? We chose to focus on mentions. They control what they say in public. As before, users can perturb, generalize, or suppress, and we studied suppression. So from the previous slide, if users chose not to mention rarely rated movies, they'd want to stick to the 22% most popular movies. That seems kind of goofy. Users want to talk about movies and not just Star Wars. So what if a user chooses to drop certain mentions? Maybe there's a forum advisor interface that says, ah, you might not want to mention that. Or you might want to mention this other movie. So the idea here is, each user suppresses some of their own mentions, and they start with rarely rated movies because they're identifying. They probably won't want to suppress very many mentions because they're there to talk about movies. Here's the result. Again, uh, along the x-axis, the fraction of user mentions suppressed, and along the y-axis is one identification rate. Suppressing 20% of your mentions drop one identification rate, some, looks like to 13% or something, but not all. And suppressing more than one of five movies that you mentioned in forums seems impractical. So here's another strategy. What if users mention items they didn't rate? That might misdirect a re-identification algorithm to look at the users who did rate that item. So let's do that. We create a misdirection list of items. Each user takes an unrated item from the list and mentions it. Repeat until not identified. So what are good misdirection lists? Remember, rarely rated items are identifying. Here are five lists we tried. The blue line is the most rarely rated movies. The line with the pink squares is rarely rated, but at least 16 times. Then we have rarely rated, but at least 1,000 times, at least 8,000 times, and just popular, the most popular movies first. Well, what we see here is rarely rated items don't misdirect at all. You could rate 20 of them, and you were still one identified at the same rate. Popular items do better, although this rate doesn't drop to zero. Even if you mentioned 15 movies you didn't rate, we can still find some of you. So in general, it's better to misdirect to a large crowd. You want to mention a movie that falsely implicates at least 1,000 or 8,000 other people. In summary, rarely rated items are identifying, but popular items are misdirecting. A few concluding words. What have we learned? Well, first, there's a real risk. Re-identification can lead to loss of privacy. We found substantial risk of re-identification in our sparse relation space. We think there are a lot of them and we're probably in more and more of them available electronically. And it's hard to preserve your privacy. The data set owner had to suppress a lot of their data set. Users had to suppress a lot of their data set. And users could misdirect somewhat using popular items. So for future work, we'd like to look at other data sets. We'd like to mod model these re-identification processes mathematically rigorously. And we'd like to look at more algorithms Re both re-identification and privacy-preserving algorithms. And there might be an arms race here between re-identifiers and privacy protectors in the same way as there's an arms race between spammers and spam detectors. Questions? Can you 
uh, have you looked at addressing this by creating fake users? So the question is, have we looked at this by addressing fake users? We have, or by creating fake users? We have not. We do have an awful lot of users, but I suppose if we created the fake users in a particular way to hide people, right? Now that might destroy the data set for other purposes, right? If you're using the data set for recommendations and you know that if someone likes movie A, they also like movie B, but then you decide to destroy that relationship for the purposes of privacy preserving, then it's not very good for recommendations either. But it's an interesting idea. say two to ten, you aggregate all their ratings and say this group of people rated these movies, possibly even have a list of different recombinations of users, such that it would be very difficult to reconstruct individual entries from it. Would this provide sort of a sufficient information blurring? So I'll just repeat the question for the video and all the crazy people. Um, the, the question was, could you aggregate users before releasing a data set? So we so I mentioned in the talk that people ge have a strategy called generalization where they aggregate items into genres, but what about aggregating users? And uh, it seems like maybe you could. I find that an interesting idea. We haven't looked at it. Other questions? If not, well, thank you very much for coming. And this is my practice talk for SIG IR, so give me, please give me feedback for next week.